Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining and welcome to yet another timely and relevant GovCon webinar from the Asian American Chamber of Commerce. I am Ed James, Vice President of BitExec, a proposal helper company. Our topic today is to learn all about GSA Polaris, and our speakers are Sai Alba from Palermo Maza and Dr. Troy Tyre from Proposal Helper. I will have each of them introduce themselves before we get started. Quick note, to participate, please feel free to network in the chat box, but all questions should, appear, should only appear in the Q&A box. We are not monitoring the chat for questions. We'll address questions at the end. Do network. This is the time to think teaming. With that, let's have our speakers introduce themselves and I will also pull up their slides. Um, and before that, uh, we do have as far as our, uh, our uh, sponsor of this event, uh, if Brian Lacey, uh, <clears throat> if you would please uh, take a moment uh, to, this, uh, to announce yourself and to also you know, tell us a little bit more uh, or say a few words. Over sure. to you, Brian. Thank you. Mobomo is an award-winning design and DevOps company located in the DC area. We help federal agencies with digital transformations to better engage and improve their customers' experiences. Some of our customers include NASA, USA.gov, FERC.gov, and NOAA Fisheries. We're excited about today's conversation because we're actually working with Proposal Helper to get ourselves ready for the Polaris GWAC. They've provided us with a great team to help organize our content, identify our experience gaps, and to prepare us for when that self-scoring framework actually drops. So to get things started, let's, I'll hand it back over to you, Ed, so we can get going. Thank you, Brian. And I will ask for Sai to uh, come on in. And so Sai, we're gonna hand it over to you and I'm gonna also go over and pull up some of our slides for you. There we go. Perfect, hey everybody. Uh, my name is Sai Alba. I'm a partner with the law firm of Polero Maza. Uh, in our government contracts group, uh, I do all things government contracts related for contractors um, and I'm happy to be here and talk about the latest and greatest, uh, newest GSA contract, Polaris. Thanks for having me. Super. Uh, what is Polaris? Uh, Polaris is a new contract vehicle. Uh, it's actually replacing Alliant to small business. Uh, and as you go through the requirements for Polaris, you'll notice a lot of similarities to, well, for one, Alliant 2. Uh, you'll notice some similarities to STARS 3. Uh, you'll also notice some similarities to OASIS. Um, so Polaris is the GSA's tool geared towards three pools of businesses. Uh, your hub zone small business, your woman-owned small business and small business as a whole. Uh, just like Alliant 2, uh, it is for IT services uh, with a focus on emerging technologies. Um, that could be artificial intelligence, it could be blockchain, um, it could be everything as a service. They list six specific ones in the draft solicitation um, but they say they're not all inclusive and the NAC codes that they use are not all inclusive. So that's kind of a real high level of what Polaris is. It's a replacement for Alliant 2. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? A little bit of background about Polaris. Uh, it does have a five-year base period and one five-year option period you can receive a task order the last day of that five-year option period. So that's why our math is terrible. That's why it says a period of performance of 15 years below that. Uh, the draft solicitation has no ceiling value uh, written into it. Uh, we're assuming that it's gonna be about a 15 to a $20, $20 billion ceiling. Uh, the primary NAC code here is for computer systems design and services which is the NAC 541512 um, with a size standard of 30 million in annual revenues. The Alliant 2, uh, their first iteration or the previous award was for 81 awardees. 
When they went back and re did a redo, it was for 120 awardees. Uh, so we're anticipating somewhere between 120 and 180 awardees for Polaris. Uh, the assumption is that that's going to be split evenly between the three pools that are available. That again would be the hub zone, the woman owned small business, and the all small business pool. Uh, we've got down there, we expect it to be released in the fall. Um, in my mind, it's fall already. I uh, don't know if it's going to make it out this fall. I think a little more realistic might be the spring of next year, but any time between the fall and spring of next year, you can kind of expect it to drop out there. Uh, next slide, please. All right, some key differences between Alliant to Small Business and Polaris. Um, as mentioned, Polaris is geared towards three pools. That's the hub zone, the woman owned small business, and the regular or all small businesses. Um, this is kind of new, I think, to GSA, is you can submit one proposal, um, and you can submit for all three pools. If you received an award in any one of the pools or all three pools, it would come to you as a separate award contract. So you could, in theory, receive three contract awards for GSA Polaris, one for small business, one for hub zone, and one for woman-owned small business. Uh, another difference is the projects for Polaris are based on their performance task areas, which are the primary task areas. There are seven of those. And it's based on emerging technologies. And as mentioned before, there are six of those. So it's no longer based on PSC codes or LETS, the leading edge technologies. They do highlight in the draft solicitation some specific NAC codes, but they caveat that with they're not all inclusive. So the takeaway here is if it's IT based, uh, you could probably use that contract for your relevant experience project. Um, and same thing with emerging technologies, if it fits in those six emerging technology categories, um, regardless of what the NAT code is, you could probably squeeze it into being one of your relevant experience projects or reps. Uh, this one is going to be a little bit different, uh, kind of has a CIOSP4. I know that's probably got people cringing right now, but a twist to it with a scorecard. Um, you will rack and stack your reps uh, a maximum of 13, seven to the primary task areas six to the emerging technology areas, so a maximum of 13. Um, and you'll get more points for the dollar value, the obligated dollar value of those contracts uh, with a minimum in the primaries of 1 million. Uh, you'll max out the points if your contract value is over 15 million. And for the emerging technologies, it's 150K uh, as a minimum. Uh, but there's also other ways, and you can go to the next slide because uh, it's going to talk the same thing on the first bullet. There are also other ways to gain points on this scorecard. Um, there, you can do it by covering uh, a larger breadth of the primary task areas or the emerging technologies. You can gain points when you apply contracts towards cloud and, ci cloud and cybersecurity. You can gain additional points if the contract's OCONUS. You can gain additional points if it's a cost reimbursement type contract, as well as if you have subcontractors working for you on that contract. Uh, there's a means to gain additional points if it is a task order underneath a multi-award contract, an IDIQ or a GWAC. Uh, you can gain additional points if you cover various federal agencies. Uh, and I know I've said points and points and points a lot, uh, there is no draft scorecard out at this point. There is a table in the back of the draft solicitation that you can use to kind of map your contracts and to kind of see where you might align, but you, you don't know at this point how many points you will get for different areas. So in essence, you really don't know where you're going to get the bang for the buck yet, not until they come out with a draft scorecard. Uh, some of the things they did away with, they did away with some of the billing certificates or criteria. Uh, they did away with extra points for an estimating system and an EVMS, an earned value management system. 
Uh, you will still have to do organizational risk assessment. Um, and there's a specific one for hub zones and woman owned small businesses for their subcontracting compliance risk. Uh, there is a cybersecurity supply chain risk management assessments that's required. Um, and all these link back to this scorecard that is not out yet. But with the past performance and the cybersecurity scrum, as well as a couple other elements, they're kind of pass or fail, uh, accept or unaccept. Uh, either you get all the points on the scorecard or you get none of the points on the scorecard. Uh, you'll get points for different certificates that you have as well, ISO search, CMMI search, facility clearances. Uh, none of those are required to receive an award on GSA Polaris, um, but you have to have them to claim the points on the scorecard for those specific things. Uh, with this one, there is no price submission required. Um, there are six volumes. None of those volumes are dealing anything with price, so price will be handled at the task order level. Uh, we're just going to kind of flip through this one, but these are some of the uh, awardees for Alliant 2. Uh, you can go to the next one, and you can kind of click through the, the previous awardees. Um, these and all other small business, you can go to the next one. And other, all other small businesses that were on Alliant 2 small business, you can kind of consider them your competition. You can consider them the incumbents, if you would, even though this is a new contract vehicle. That vehicle is ending and they're all going to be trying to jump over to GSA Polaris. So some concerns here. I'll start on this one side and I'll jump over to you, sir, if that's OK. I think the next one is talking on teaming. And I really don't want to get into the legalities on the teaming arrangements. Uh, but as mentioned, this has got a five year base and one five year option period. Uh, the subcontracting limitations are going to be carried across the task orders for each of the five year periods. Uh, it is a GWAC um, and it's gonna be carried to the three pools that we talked about, the hub zone, the woman owned small business and the small businesses as a whole. Uh, we've already talked about the next bullet where it, you only submit one proposal, you tell them what pools you want to go after and you can receive an award for each one of those pools where you qualify and you meet the the competitive criteria to meet the range of awards they want to make in that one. Uh, pass through task orders are prohibited, uh, even though the SBA rules do allow it for similarly situated subcontractors. Uh, si, I know you're gonna to touch on that one here in just a minute. Um, same thing with the SBA rules for subcontracting. Uh, to team on this one, and I'm just going to touch on this just real quickly, Cy. Um, my read is, and a layman's reads would be that there's kind of two ways to team on this. Uh, that would be as a JV or as a prime sub relationship. The draft has got specific criteria for what you can use from each of your teaming partners. Um, and again, Cy, you're going to jump in on this one in a second anyway. But as a JV, um, to claim a industry cert for a JV, and I don't know the legalities of this, it does not sound right to me, but the JV must have the cert itself or every member of the JV must have the cert to claim it. And with the prime sub, the certs will be claimed from the prime and not the subcontractors. For both teaming arrangements, you can use any teaming partners contracts for the relevant experience projects, uh, the difference comes or the constraint comes when you start talking about the industry search, facility clearances, things like that. Uh, there is no 8A or service disabled veteran owned small business pools underneath GSA Polaris. The contract vehicles for those are VETS 2 for the service disabled and STARS 3 for the 8As. Next slide, please. All right, Sai, sir, um, over to you. I know I touched a little bit on, on the teaming arrangements, but I'm sure you're going to go a little bit more in depth on that. Yeah, and I think ju just a couple things on what you just mentioned. So there's the reason I think the five-year base period with a five-year option is important to note 
and the whole issue of limitation on subcontracting is that under the SBA rules, it's period by period. So if this was a one plus nine, you would have to meet the limitation on subcontracting across all task orders that you have each year, right? But because it's a five plus five, right? It's, you only have to do it over that whole five-year period. And it's interesting that they're making you, I think CIOs before did the same thing. They're making you report limitation on subcontracting information on an annual basis, because I think that's what the FAR still says. Um, so in theory, you could be reporting that you're not meeting limitation on subcontracting in year two, and that doesn't matter. Le legally, from an SBA perspective, uh, you're not in violation of the, of the law in that regard, but you could be in violation of the contract. So I think it's important, and obviously we don't know what the contract is going to say. The final RFP isn't even out yet. But if the if the contract did say something like, you know, you have to do this, you have to do it annually, you have to provide this, and if you are outside of compliance, we can terminate you. I think there's some language in there. If if you can if you continue to do it, um, I think there needs to be a discussion with the contracting officer, and hopefully in the final RFP, it might clarify and align with SBA rules on that. Um, cause that could be a going forward compliance issue. Um, the other thing with, with having, it's not really clear, but it seems like they're going to make a different contract award for each pool. So as Troy was mentioning, you'll have like three contracts. If you're a, you know, woman owned hub zone firm, you can in theory have three contracts, one for small, one woman owned one hub zone. And in that case, there's always a question of, well, if I no longer qualify for hub zone, can I shift from one? So let's say you have you're a woman-owned company right now, and you get a, a small business award, a woman-owned uh, contract, and or maybe you just have woman-owned. Can you switch if your a woman owner retires? Can you switch over and just be a small business at that point? That's what's not clear, but the way it's written, it seems like there's some risk that if you lose your status or can't recertify for one reason or another, if they're different contracts, you can't easily switch. It's a whole different contract. So you might have to wait for an on-ramp period. That's why that point was um, uh, somewhat, somewhat important because it just raises that issue. Um, now getting into more of the, the teaming stuff, as we say here, like more CTA confusion, it's everybody's favorite topic. Um, again, Polaris, like COS before, uses this term CTA when they're talking about uh, teaming. I know that makes people think of GSA CTAs and it, it's not that. I, I said this for COS before, I'll say, say it again. Like all this really means is you're either a joint venture or you're a prime sub. For small businesses in particular, this I think is, is more of an absolute truth. Whereas under COS before, you could be a large business, right? So let's say you said, oh, I don't wanna form a joint venture. I don't wanna be a prime sub. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do a partnership because the farce is partnership or joint venture. I'm gonna do partnership that's not a joint venture. In theory, as a large business, you have a little more flexibility because there aren't other laws and rules you have to contend with. But when you're a small business, if you form something that's a partnership and not a joint venture, uh, it raises a host of other problems because especially if you're dealing with woman-owned and hub zone rules, there are pr particular regulations that must be complied with when forming a joint venture. And if you're forming a partnership and you're not calling it a joint venture, what is that? If you get size protested and somebody says you're not a small business, SBA is going to pull out their rules. They're going to say, okay, I'm looking at this proposal and the team agreement or whatever else you have. I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say, are these people a small business? Well, there's all the rules for the prime, whether you're small or not, and just adding up numbers and looking at your revenues. But there's also all kinds of affiliation rules. And as part of that is the, the joint venture rules or if you own a business together. So if you just formed a partnership and you followed none of the joint venture rules, then that partnership you created doesn't take on the status of hub zone or woman owned. It's just this other company you, you made. If you want that partnership to actually take on the qualities of the managing member, you have to form a joint venture. So I, I think in this particular context, 
And, oh, and the joint venture has to have very particular things in the joint venture agreement. You have to have an agreement, has to comply with all the rules. And so if you don't do that and you're protested, there's a very real risk that you will lose the contract after winning because you'll get thrown out on a, a size challenge or a hub zone or woman owned challenge. So I think I implore everyone who's going after this, if you have any inclination that you're going to team together or potentially form a joint venture, go set up some sort of LLC and go get a cage code because cage codes take 20 to 30 days. I can't tell you how many people were worried about this with CSP4. A number of people probably submitted under CSP4 um, doing this kind of weird, what are we scenario? And that's risky. And if you just want to avoid risk, make it clean, make it easy, sleep well at night, go get an LLC, set it up. It's not expensive to do that and get a cage code for it. And now you just have an LLC sitting there and you can form a joint venture easy and easy peasy, right? Um, so I would recommend doing that sooner rather than later so you don't get stuck behind the cage code problem. Um, then when you look at this section five, uh, L5132, it seems to indicate that only small businesses are eligible subcontractors. I think what they're saying is for evaluation purposes. So as of the draft RFP, if you have a subcontractor that's a large business, um, you cannot rely upon them. But if it's a small business, you can rely upon them. Then the question comes up, and I think this is one of the questions that was, that was asked, um, what about mentors? Well, the RFP, as it's currently drafted, is silent on that. I assume that in the final RFP, they will add something to it, just like with COS before, to clarify that mentors are fine. Otherwise, they're going to get protests, and they're going to lose those protests because I don't see any reason why you, you would exclude the mentor. Um, one thing of note though with COSP4 is it said you could only use your mentor for say one experience level under that contract. So I could see some restriction and then it was protested, actually we protested it and it got moved from one to two. Um, I think that's a scenario where there could be something similar in Polaris. So just be aware of that as well. Watch to see if they try to put some limitation on mentors because um, that's a, a potential possibility. If you're bidding this as a prime sub relationship though, note that it, uh, FAR, uh, it should be 52, sorry, FAR 52.207-6 is incorporated into, the, into this solicitation. It was, it was not incorporated in COS before, then it was put in, then it was taken out again. And what's important about that is that FAR provision is not very clear and it doesn't, it wasn't really intended to be a particular requirement like it's being used here and hopefully they remove it. Um, but if they don't remove it, it has some language in it that suggests you need to show the work share in your teaming agreement and in your small business teaming agreement that you're submitting uh, here. And if you're required to put in there your work share, that can be very difficult for companies. So I think the best thing we can say if this remains is that you put in as much detail as humanly possible as to the work share. I had uh, clients for the last go around, say us before, who tried to put something in there and said, okay, well, these are the, these are the task areas that everyone's gonna be responsible for. This is the type of work we think they're gonna do. And this is how we intend to do it something like that to ensure compliance. Um, but if they remove it, obviously people will have uh, more wiggle room there. Um, I think there's some high, high risk here, right? If you submit something that's not a teaming agreement, it's a prime sub relationship or not an actual joint venture. This is what I was saying earlier. I think if you're submitting, if you're trying to say, well, we're not prime sub, we're not a joint venture, we're a CTA. And uh, I've heard people under the last RFP, right? Also say, well, our, our people, our, our sub says they don't wanna be a sub, they wanna be a, a prime, they want privity of contract with the government. Um, there's really only two entities that have privity of, of contract with the government. You've got a prime and a prime sub relationship and in a joint venture, it's the JV. The members technically don't have direct privity of contract with the government. so. This idea that you, you want to form some sort of CTA that's not 
a prime sub and not a joint venture so everyone can get privity is a misunderstanding of what privity really is. And so I would just note that for folks so they're um, aware of it. Um, sort of moving on to the, the next slide here. Uh, it's also important to note that the, all subs must be registered in SAM. Um, there's always been some confusion as to whether or not this was required. Uh, for a while, it wasn't. And uh, just to be clear, this RFP is requiring that. So just make sure are all your subs, if, if it stays the same, all your subs are required to be, to be registered. Um, there was a question that was asked on this point in particular, which I know is confusing and we'll see how this shakes out. I think Troy mentioned it, but system certifications and clearances must come from the prime only if you're in a prime sub relationship. However, past performance can come from the prime or any of the proposed subcontractors, but the proposed subcontractors we're talking about here are small businesses not large businesses and arguably as written right now, not mentors, but again, I think that's going to, to change. So if you're talking about the system certifications or clearances like facility clearances in the prime subcontract context, the prime has to have, has to have it. That being said, if you have affiliates and then the affiliates of team members could also um, provide experience, past performance systems, and certifications. Um, it's not clear if it's affiliates of team members uh, or if it's just your affiliates as a uh, prime contractor and then the other team members you're, you're working with. Um, if they were to go expansive on this, which I think makes sense, I think they would probably include um, affiliates of team members, but a point about using affiliate experience and past performance is that you have to make sure that the affiliate you're relying on is going to provide some sort of meaningful assistance to this procurement. And so if this remains unchanged, and they allow affiliate member experience and performance and systems and certifications, you need to say in your proposal, for all of these affiliates, and especially if it allows team members too, you need to explain how that affiliate or that team member affiliate is going to actually provide the assistance that you're, you're citing to. So if um, they have some sort of past performance you wanna use or some sort of experience you wanna use, it's not enough to just say, oh, well, uh, I have a holding company that I own and uh, let's say we have a holding company and then we have two sister companies that are 100% owned by the holding company. One's a hub zone, one's a small business. That wouldn't work for woman owned, so I'll leave that out. But if you have a hub zone and a small business and you're bidding with the hub zone firm and you say, oh, I'm going to use my other company that small business is uh, experienced in past performance, even though they're owned by a common parent, 100%, no question they're affiliated that alone is not enough to allow you to use the experience of past performance, even though the RFP allows it, you still have to make sure there's some nexus between the other affiliated company and this particular contract. Doesn't mean they have to be a subcontractor, but they have to be providing something to you that is meaningful. Um, and that's something that it's, it's a little wishy-washy as to what you need to do there. But if that's a scenario where you're going to use an affiliate, it's just important to note as well. So you are um, on, on top of that. Um, next, if you're in a joint venture, the joint venture can rely on the experience and past performance of all members. But as Troy noted for certifications, and I think there, there was a question on this about ISO, uh, CMMI, that sort of thing. You can only have the joint venture um, get credit for whatever level of certification are shared commonly by all members. So if you have three members to a JV that have CMMI level three and one member that have CMI level one, that joint venture's bid is going to be a CMMI level one bid because that's the only level that is common amongst all of the JV members. 
Um, whether or not that too would change or whether or not that's unduly restrictive of competition is certainly something that could be argued, um, in particular in the context of facility clearances. So there was a recent GAO case that said that DOD, and I know this is not DOD, but the, the case said DOD has to allow the joint venture uh, with multiple members that all have a certain level of facility clearance to be treated as if it has that same level of clearance. But again, that case was all about if all members have it, and it was only for DOD because it was based on the, uh, the NDAA. So there's a, a question as to whether or not that same analysis would apply to civilian agencies and whether or not, what if only one member of a JV has a clearance and the other members do not or don't have the requisite clearance, then how is that going to be treated? DCSA put out, before this GAO case I just talked about, DCSA put out a notice stating that they weren't necessarily going to follow the SBA rules right now. They were going to investigate the implications and whether or not SBA had authority, whether they were going to agree with those rules. But the SBA rules say, if both members of a JV have the clearance, then the JV has to be treated as having it. I think that's that part of it is exactly what Polaris is saying already. But what it also says under the SBA rules that came out last November is that if one member, let's say the uh, say protege in a mentor protege joint venture has a level of clearance, then that's also sufficient because they're the managing member, they're performing the primary and vital requirements. The SBA rules went a step further and said, well, what if, what if the other member, the mentor, or let's say you're in a hub zone JV and it was just a vanilla small business that's not a hub zone. What if that party has the facility clearance and you don't? SBA still said that's okay, and the JV can still be treated as having a facility clearance for purposes of, of evaluation, so long as the cleared work is not primary and vital to the contract, and also um, so long as there's some sort of you know firewall system, obviously. So in this context, because it's an IDIQ, that's for all kinds of work, not just cleared work arguably they should allow companies to come in or get some level of points for that because that's what the SBA rules allow. But then on a task order by task order basis, as these things come out in our bid, that's where I think the question comes up as to whether or not the other agencies are going to try to restrict things further. And if so, that could raise other protest issues or hopefully we get more clarification and guidance either from DCSA or otherwise on that, on that particular point. Um, so that's sort of the FCL issue with, with joint ventures and, and teaming. Next, if you're talking, if we're talk, we talked about risk, I think briefly, it was noted by, by Troy, there's this idea that um, a risk analysis will be performed and based upon uh, teaming and whether you're going to, you can meet limitation on subcontracting, all of that. Uh, it's interesting what's the way it's written in here because it talks about risk being evaluated depending on the makeup of your team. And it insinuates, I think, that if you've never teamed together before or you've never been a managing member of a joint venture with these folks and you're bidding now as a joint venture, that there could be a, a, a decrement. So they could reduce your score because there's some risk there and there's a factor where that could negatively impact your, your proposal. Um, whether again, that stands up to scrutiny I would think it probably would because of the way uh, GAO has ruled on these sorts of issues in the past, where GSA has created the scorecard for a number of procurements now. Um, there were a lot of protests under OASIS that something was unduly restrictive of competition because they you know, were requiring everyone in a team to have whatever the lowest common denominator was, and that's unduly restrictive or that it's unduly restrictive, that there's this risk analysis being, being performed. 
But what's interesting is GAO essentially looked at all of that and they said, oh, you know, I don't know if that's true because GSA, you're sort of an evil genius and you've created this, this evaluation scheme where nothing is absolutely required or only very few things are absolutely required as a gating measure. It's only whether or not you get a certain amount of points or not. And because it's not a gating measure, if you protest, you can't act absolutely say that you're in or out. It, because until something actually happens and there's an award, you don't know how these points impacted you. And if you lost points on various other areas, and then this one issue didn't necessarily take you over the top. And so that's one of those things where they've, they've written this, I think, to, to insulate themselves a bit. And it can be frustrating, I think, to, to bidders because you're saying, well, this, this could kill us. This, this, this issue could kick us out, um, but it can, be, it, it can be difficult to challenge that. Uh, that being said, I think they've heard from people about this, and uh, there's, I think there's going to be some changes in the final RFP, and I guess we'll, we'll see what happens and what they, what they actually say. Um, going to another question that was actually asked, uh, I'm just looking at them right now. Somebody has a can can past performance be used across multiple bids, and that's this this next issue here, um, that talks about if oh, I just lost it. If you um, have a particular project that you're using for the primary relevant experience or emerging technology experience or um, some other one of the areas. No project can be used in, in more than one contract in the same pool. So if, you, if you're in a situation where you have um, one project that you're trying to use and it's, let's say you're a subcontractor over here and then you're a prime in another area, you're a, a sub on the hub zone and you're a prime on woman, let's say. You can use that same project on both of those right? Because they're different pools. But if you decide I want to form a joint venture with some of these guys to maximize my possible chances of getting in, but I also would really want to be a prime. So I want to bid as a prime and as a JV in the same pool, then you cannot use the same contractor experience for both of those proposals because they're in the same pool. So I think that's that's the answer to sort of whether or not you can use them across multiple bids. It, it depends. It depends on that um, scenario. Um, kind of going back also to the idea of JVs and, that, that, and teams and that risk analysis, someone asked, uh, from your perspective, for a mentor protege program-based JV having no prior working experience, is there any risk there? I would say as it's currently drafted, there is some um, exposure there that they could they could say there's extra risk. But I think you even the way it's written right now, if you have another JV, because you know it used to be that three contracts in two years, now it's just as many contracts as you want in a two year period. So if you had a joint venture for a while and that sort of LLC has expired under the SBA rules and you've just created a new one or you just got uh, a new mentor. If it's a brand new mentor you've never worked before, I think that's higher risk as drafted that there's gonna be a potential de decrement to the score. Whereas if you've worked with your mentor in another JV, it just happened to expire, or you can't use it under the SBA rules. That's a much lower risk because you've worked with them before and you could demonstrate that. Um, just trying to go through some of these questions. It said, how about a small business does have any uh, prior work under a JV? I, I think there too, if you are forming a joint venture for the first time and you've never sort of worked together before, then I do think that the fact that, especially if you're the managing member, I think they might start taking that into account and 
reduce the score a bit in in that context because you've never worked together in the past or because you've never actually worked um in a in a joint venture prior to that um okay so going back to some of the other issues then i'll we'll go through some of the more of the the questions as the, those were kind of directly on point um aside from risk it's also true that if if you're a, a hub zone or a woman owned small business you have to control the team which is it is not just meeting the limitation on subcontracting because this is something that is has been creeping up in the false claim act defense work that I, I i do as well is the department of justice and the various ig offices are keying in on this idea that people think we just have to meet performance of work and we're good and if we're meeting performance of work then clearly we're doing everything right that's not exactly true so you also have to make sure if you're the prime and your hub zone or woman owned small business that you are actually in control of that team that you're you're in control of the subcontractors you're in control of uh, sort of bid no bid things you're in control of what's really going on now if you have subcontractors that are similarly situated like you're a hub zone you have a hub zone subcontractor a woman owned you have a woman owned subcontractor that's something where you could work together and one person could control some aspects, one person could control another, that would be perfectly fine. Same thing if you're in a joint venture. If you're in a joint venture and you have a number of different members, if you're going after the hub zone or woman owned track, the hub zone or woman owned business has to have the control there, not just meeting limitation on subcontracting. Also remember if you're a joint venture, there's multiple tiers of limitation on subcontracting. The first is that the joint venture itself, meaning all members in that JV combined, including a mentor, if, if you have a mentor protege JV, all of those are um, combined have to meet the 50% rule. So for IT services, 50% of the total cost of the contract has to be performed by all of those companies combined. But that's not enough. In addition to that, out of whatever percentage those companies do, if it's if you have five companies in a JV and each one's doing 10% of the contract um, and the other 50% or say 49 is being subcontracted to a large business, that's potentially a problem. Because if you're a hub zone JV or woman owned JV, the hub zone or woman owned companies respectively have to do at least 40% of whatever work the JV is doing. So the JV members, there's five of them, they're doing 50% and you only have one hub zone company and they're doing 10%, that's not a violation of the 50% rule of the what I call the external performance of work requirements, but it is a violation of the internal performance of work requirements, the 40% rule. Instead, that one hub zone company would have to be doing 40% of that work, not 10%. So that's just something to keep in mind. And again, under SBA rules, that's over the over all task orders over the life of the entire five-year period and then you start over for the next five-year period but the way the rfp is currently drafted you have to give information and certify on an annual basis which arguably means you have to be looking across all task orders each year to give them a number that shows you're meeting the 50 and the the 40 What's interesting though, is the RFP also seems to ignore the 40% and it just talks about the 50% seemingly. So it's possible that they're not even tracking the internal performance of work. But again, I would note that that's something DOJ and the IG has been very keen on recently. Um, and that's also true for mentor protege joint ventures. I have two cases right now that are for, with the Department of Justice that are false claims act against a mentor and a protege team where allegedly the mentor, even if things were written in the mentor-protege agreement, the mentor was doing too much. They were helping in a way that DOJ doesn't like. Like, let's say for the proposal they were putting together, the mentor said they wrote it. It was the first one they've ever done together. They wrote the proposal and said, here, this is what these things look like. Take, take a look at it. Let me know your thoughts. Protege is like, oh yeah, this looks great. Let's just submit it. Okay, fine. That's the kind of thing DOJ has, an, has been taking issue with recently 
from the cases that I've seen where they're saying, no, you can't just do it for them. You need to like help them write it or, or, you know, sit down with them and work through it, not just do it yourself. Same thing goes true once performance starts. You can't just jump in and if you're the mentor or if it's a hub zone, you're not a hub zone, you can't just jump in and take over those things. The hub zone, the woman-owned company really has to be in control of, of all of this um, across the board. So just uh, just keep, keep note of that issue. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'll jump in here real quick, Sai. Sure. Um, there was a question on the cybersecurity supply chain risk management program as far as explain the pass or fail. Um, either they like what you put down or they didn't, so it's acceptable or unacceptable. If it's acceptable, i.e. a pass, you get full points on the scorecard. If they do not feel that it's acceptable, then it would be a fail and you would get no points on the scorecard. This and the other narratives like the professional employee compensation plan, uncompensated overtime, overtime policy, those should be written from, if you're a JV, from the JV's perspective. Uh, if it's a prime sub relationship, then it would be the prime writing that. You can talk about your subcontractors, but as the prime contractor and as the JV, it would be your plan or your plans. Uh, sorry, Cy. Si. No, no, that, that, that's, that's great information. Um, and that's where, right before we jump into more of the, the questions, there's a couple of things. So the GSA said they're also using an S, a new SCRM tool to evaluate compliance, but it's not really clear what that is. Um, so I'd, I'd be interested to see what the final RFP is saying about that. And there's also a question, given the new Biden cybersecurity executive order, whether that's going to come into play. In, in this level of the RFP, meaning the umbrella contract, or if it's something they're really gonna raise later whenever you do the, the task orders. In particular, this whole idea of a software bill of materials and knowing where your software came from and being able to take uh, each software product that you're developing or creating and breaking down all the subcomponents if you're using open source or whatever and where it came from and who developed it and how you've tested out um, whether or not it's safe. I know there are companies out there that are trying to gear up to, to have like a database that hope, they're hoping would be like the, the Dun & Bradstreet of the sort of software bill of materials where the government will bless it. And they will also say, okay, um, if your company, you don't need to give us a full software bill of materials, breaking down every little thing, which is sort of what the requirement seems to be in the executive order. If you get approval from this company over here and they've run it through their system, we're comfortable with that. Ideally, that's what the future holds. Um, but again, we'll have to see what happens with this final RFP because it's just, it's just not clear what exactly uh, they're going to be requiring there. The other thing, Troy, I think in the RFP, it talks about CMMC and the SCRM and how you have to be, at least in the draft, it says, you have to be preparing for those things and show that you're doing something. It didn't seem like they've gotten as far as of saying you have to have the, this plan in place. Now, obviously, CMMC is not even fully mature yet. Um, but with SCRM, not that you have to have like the entire plan sitting there, but you have to be showing that you're preparing to do those things and you've taken actual steps towards it. Um, is that your understanding? Yes, I, um, and there was a question on that. There are no points for CMMC. There's no requirement to have CMMC to receive an award on this. Um, you can expect CMMC to be required on some of the task orders as it matures more. Um, but currently, there's no requirement for that. Now, as far as the cybersecurity, the SCRM, cyber, the supply chain risk management, uh, the cybersecurity scrum, there's an assessment due, a seven-page assessment due with the proposal. So you're doing a self-assessment where you're at, how you're doing. Uh, you definitely want to talk about CMMC in there and that you're willing to do it and prepared to do it. And there is a requirement for a supply chain risk management plan every year, uh, but not with proposal submission. So it would be the first year after award. 
Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, another thing I think with section 889 and uh, use by subcontractors, um, this is just something that we're sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop on this. Um, they were supposed to put out some more guidance. It never really came out yet. So this, that's just something, an FYI for people to be aware of is, yeah, you're going to, if they really start enforcing this, you have to make sure that your subcontractor isn't using any of the covered uh, telecommunications or surveillance tech technology in the work they're doing for you. But it doesn't mean you have to make them certify that they're not using it anywhere in their business. If they're a prime contractor somewhere, they're already going to have to be certifying to that. Um, but to be a sub to you under any particular federal contract, they just have to say they're not using it in the performance of um, the contract with you. So it's kind of a, a, a nuance there. Um, I think some of these other questions, and you know, Troy, feel free to jump in too, but it says rumor on the street reports that JVs are passe and the government is all but discouraging them. Um, I think what's happening here, and I think I may have said this in other contexts, in, is that awarding agencies, I think that's somewhat true, that they really want one belly button to push. And I kind of get the impression they really want large businesses <laughs> who are small to do all this work. Um, with all this consolidation, like that's what's happening, right? I mean, you have these task orders that are $20 million task orders. Um, can people really do that by themselves? And But at the same time, SBA is making regulatory pushes, right, to, pu to push that back. They're saying, no, 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 you can't do that agency. You have to allow experience. You have to allow past performance. You have to allow facility clearances. You have to treat uh, the members as if they're all the same. You, you can't push back on that. And I think Congress, to a certain extent, is doing that as well. So I think um, any of you protest, I think you'd win. So that's sort of my take on that point. Yeah, so I'm going to take one more, and it looks like Ed's getting ready to give us the hook. Um, there was a question here about, can you use different projects for different pools? Um, you're only going to submit one proposal. So the reps or the projects you use for your reps are going to be in that proposal, and you're going to tell them which of the three pools you want to go after. Can you sub on another team and prime one? The way it's written now, the answer is yes. However, your contract can only show up in one proposal. So if you've got enough contracts to cover that, uh, my thought would be yes. So, Sai, uh, quick 10 or 15 seconds on a rebuttal to that. No, I think that's that's absolutely right. All right, Ed, back over to you, sir. I see the hook coming out. No, not the hook, but uh, we are coming up to the top of the hour. And I wanted to uh, bring Rena uh, Bafia, our CEO, uh, into the conversation uh, for any closing comments and uh, any other additional input she would like to have as far as on this call. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Sai. As always, awesome, awesome information. Troy, thank you for uh, pulling this along. And I hope that everybody got a ton of information out of this. If you're not a member of the Asian American Chamber of Commerce, please join so that you can get a copy of this recording immediately and the presentations. The rest of you will just have to wait a little while to get it. Our members will get it first. So please join if you're not a member. Uh, we will be doing more of these on Polaris. The questions don't stop. I mean, there are so many questions. We'll try to get those answers out through different communication tools. But again, thank you all for joining us and stay tuned for more webinars in the future. Thank you, Polaro Madza. Thank you, Sai. Thank you, uh, Troy, for doing this and our sponsor today. Brian, thank you, Mobomo, for sponsoring the event.